the angel space is a really it's a uh, it's a a fun space for investors because we have access to tons of new ideas and new products. Our goal is really just to expose as many students as possible to entrepreneurship and then get them out into the world and and get them connected to that ecosystem. I thought about it and I was like, how can I make the largest positive impact? And I I thought that I could do that by starting a nonprofit instead. Uh, So I pivoted and then created a, a nonprofit. What they wanted was to have somebody working with their student who their student looked up to or who their child looked up to. So they were really looking for a mentor. They weren't coming to me because of some crazy academic achievement. I'm Richard Gearhart. And I'm Elizabeth Gearhart. You've just heard some clips from our show tonight. It was a great one. So stay tuned for the rest. I'm Richard Gearhart, an intellectual property attorney specializing in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And I'm Elizabeth Gearhart the Chief Marketing Officer at Gearheart Law, and I also have a startup of my own. So welcome to Passage to Profit, the show that's all about entrepreneurs, small businesses, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. Tonight, we have a repeat offender on the show. His name is Sandy Woolman. Uh, we've all uh, loved and enjoyed his insight and his energy, and he's going to be here today uh, talking about investing and also what makes a startup uh, viable and uh, some of the some of the characteristics that are are needed for a successful business. After that, we're going to be talking with Heim Letwin, who is a, an associate professor at Suffolk University and heads up the entrepreneurial program there. So, welcome to the show. We're going to have lots of interesting insights and entrepreneurial secrets for you. And Heim has brought two of his amazing students with him. We are so excited to hear from them. We have Noah Trofimo, who is helping students with that ever-present anxiety and mental health issues. <laughs> Not just students, Not just all students, of us, right? No, that's, yeah. and, and then Greta Thurston, who's also helping with anxiety by helping people find tutors <laughs> that can help them through school. So yes, we're reducing the anxiety in the world. We're and excited I think that's to hear a from good thing. So, but before we get to our distinguished panel, uh, we have IP in the news. uh, And today, we're going to be talking about trademarks. Elizabeth, um, can you trademark the sound of a beer can opening? I know the answer to that. Honestly, yeah, we talked about yes, it. Before you can the show. trademark a lot of sounds. We did one show where we went through all these trademark sounds and had people try to guess what they were. But I know the answer to this one, according to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Well, I'll share it with my, I I mean, it is kind of a matter of common sense. But the fact is, is that Anheuser-Busch actually tried to register a trademark for the sound of opening a can of beer. So obviously the Trademark Office denied it, but there's a little bit of a funny story here. I want to tell you how they described the sound in the trademark application. It says the mark consists of a clicking sound followed by a period of silence followed by a deeper clicking sound. Now that's pretty specific, don't you think? I mean, that's very, that, that could not apply to anything, right? No, it's, it's, it's too generic. It's a, it's, 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 it's functional. There's like a thousand reasons why um, the trademark office denied the mark. But what is also funny is that the trademark office examiner did a video and he lined up four beer cans along with a Coke can. And he did a video opening four different kinds of beers. And he said, and then the Coke can, of course, and he said, see, they all sound the same. So it's generic. You can't get the trademark. He made a video of this and put it in the record. And this, the sad part about this story is that the trademark office would not pay for the alcoholic beverages he used in his demonstration, but they did pay for the non-alcoholic beverages. So uh, <laughs> there's some sort of policy out there floating around the trademark office that you can't use alcoholic or you can't be reimbursed for uh, alcoholic beers. So anyway, um, the moral of the story is you, you, you can't trademark uh, the sound of a beer can opening I'm sure that's something that our, our, our student presenters would have no knowledge of anyway in the show. Um, but I, I would also say that it, it is possible to trademark sounds. They just have to be distinctive and specifically associated with your brand. 
So that being said, it's time for the round table. Sandy, what are your thoughts about this whole story? Um, I wonder uh, how the uh, Budweiser legal attorneys actually had the gall to try to pay <laughs> Um, if it was outside counsel, I wonder how much they paid them. If it was inside counsel, maybe they need to rotate their counsel a little bit. But, uh, you know, listen, you guys are the experts in this area, but that seems pretty far out, man. I mean, that seems really crazy, man. I, you know, uh, I can just imagine, Sandy, it came from the marketing department. <laughs> They've got nothing else to do. They got no other ways to market their products than to, to go for the sound of a beer can opening. How generic can you be? And then what, what are you going to do? You're going to sue all your customers that drink different brands of beer. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you know? so how do you, how do you enforce it? I know it's ridiculous. How could you possibly enforce that? I mean, that would be the red letter day for the attorney to send out cease and desist letters. You know, I mean, Really? 300 million people. I'm going right? to get sued because I drink a beer? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> so anyway, it's hilarious. So, uh, Haim, what are your thoughts about this from an academic perspective? <laughs> <laughs> Purely from an academic perspective. You know, actually, you know, I, I'm curious because earlier on you said you did a show where you went through all these different sounds that were trademarked. Uh, you know, in your experience, what's the what's the kind of uh, most interesting or unique or crazy sound uh, that you guys have, have, have seen trademarked? You know, that's a that's an that's an interesting question. And we to be perfectly blunt, uh, we haven't filed that many trademarks on sounds. We've filed a couple on perfume scents, which you can also trademark, but sure. we haven't filed it on uh, on on sounds. Um, I the most unusual one would probably be uh, the I would say what would be the least expected. Um, I would say probably the, uh, I'm just going to, the, the NBC logo is probably the most famous. Ding, ding, ding. Like, the mm. ding, dum, ding. dum, dum. Yeah. yeah. You have yep. to have a sense of pitch to be able to, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't possess, <laughs> but no, that's a good question. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's really kind of difficult to get a, a trademark on a sound and a lot of companies don't pursue them. There aren't that many marks in that area. Um, and, but um, for certain big institutions that have a real strong brand association, uh, it does, it, it, it does make sense. So. Yeah, you could copyright music, right? That's a sound, but that's a copyright. It's not a trademark. Right. So Sandy's absolutely right. And uh, as a singer songwriter, he, he knows that he's copyrighted some music. So um, I think, you know, it, it, that's the more traditional way to go, though. Sandy's right is, is, is with copyright. So. so on to Noah. Noah, what are your thoughts? Sure. Um, I guess I think that's really interesting that they would attempt to do it. I mean, we're here talking about it now, so maybe they saw it as, if anything, we get some publicity out of it. But it, it makes me think about like trademark trolls as well, about these people that go out looking specifically about how they can get a trademark to abuse it or maybe do something that isn't necessarily furthering their business. Yeah, I mean, that's an important consideration. And I like the way you're thinking strategically there, because there are times to do things, not just for the purpose of, of actually getting the mark. I mean, maybe they had a bet or something in the legal department, who knows, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 there's times when legal processes are used for public purposes too. Yeah. So that's a good point. Greta? Yeah, I actually had two initial thoughts on this. My first one was when you were talking about how the trademark, if it was specific to the brand, maybe it could be trademarked. And maybe this is a segue for them to make a special beer can opening sound that then they can trademark. There Who knows? So. Um, but then I also had a question on some of your past podcasts, you've talked about how trademarks are used on different mediums, right? Mm -hmm. What medium were they trademarking this for? Well, 
they they would have been trademarking it. So once you get a, a trademark, uh, and in the case, let's just say hypothetically, they did get the the beer can sound trademark, which of course would be completely ridiculous. But then any any medium where the that sound is heard you know, in a bar, uh, at home, uh, on a commercial, um, any of those any of those places could be potentially uh, places where the trademark would would be um, you know you know, enforceable. So um, it's really it's 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 when you get a trademark, it's it's based on how it's used, not necessarily where it's used, and so. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. So um, great uh, thoughts, everybody. Yeah, great thoughts, everybody. Now I want to hear from Sandy. Yeah, well, why, why don't you introduce Sandy? Oh, I get to introduce the one and only the great Sandy Woolman. Fine, please, please, please. <laughs> Sandy is a staple in Westchester's angel investment landscape. Sandy has done so much. What's really cool about Sandy is that he had a corporate career and he made a lot of money, obviously, or he wouldn't be doing investing, right? Yeah. And he started Westchester Angels and he had, he's the co-founder of that. And he's now helping entrepreneurs. So he went from corporate to entrepreneurism, just like you did. Huh. And he- I'm following in his footsteps. <laughs> and so he's here today to help the entrepreneurs on the show and also any entrepreneurs that have questions for him about how to move a product forward because it's really what he's helping people do is taking their ideas and inventions and getting them into the marketplace with this angel investing so welcome sandy thank you very much for having me and for the most kind words elizabeth thank you very much well that's um and that's typical of sandy so he's very uh very humble guy despite mountains of talent. So, uh, um, so anyway, we're here with uh, some student uh, inventors, uh, possibly considering uh, careers in entrepreneurism. What would you tell them? Well, you know, the, um, the angel space is a really, it's a, uh, <clears throat> it's a, a fun space for investors, because we have access to tons of new ideas and new products and uh it's a uh, it's a helpful space you know angel investing comes right after uh, friends and family if you're raising money and uncle fred gave uh you know his niece money because she loves him um he loves her whatever but uh, we're we're the next in line and angel investing we take on the most risk on average, 60 or more percent of angel investments will fail across the country because we're early stage, sometimes pre-revenue. Most of the time where there's just a little bit of revenue coming up the right side of the hockey stick. So most all angel groups in the area compensate for that by doing extensive due diligence and adding as much value and help as we can. As you go up the ladder, if you're fortunate enough to execute and go up the ladder to the VCs and, and over and above that, it, it, it loses the personal touch a lot of times. It's more business oriented. And, uh, you know, if you don't, I could take, uh, take your viewers and uh, Noah and Greta through the process if that would be helpful. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So if you're looking for angel funding, um, there are two platforms that uh, you have to apply to online. And this is the first step for all angel groups. You know, I lead an initiative that brings all the angel group leaders together in the tri-state area, New York City area. So I'm intimately familiar with all the angel groups in New York City in the area, about 15 or 20, from the Golden Seeds, the 37 Angels, the Gangels, and, uh, you know, the Harvard Business Alumni of New York intimately familiar with all of them, but we all have the basic same process. The first is to apply online on one of the two platforms that are most widely used. The first one is called GUST, G-U-S-T.com. And the second most popular web uh, platform is called Proceder, P-R-O-S-E-E-D-E-R.com. So the first step is to apply online. You put your slide deck on, you put your financials, 
it'll take you about an hour or more to apply online. And we advise startups to agonize over this application because it's got to stick out. Most angel groups get about 50 to 150 applications a month. Something has to stick out. A couple of red flags to avoid. Don't use a Gmail email address. You know, make sure your, your URL is the business that you're using. Uh, you know, Greta at xyzbusiness.com. Um, a couple of other red flags. Um, we like C Corps just compared to LLC, so we avoid the dreaded K1s. Um, your slide deck uh, has to be done really, really well. Investors, angel investors don't read business plans. We read slide decks. And we have a pitch guide that helps our uh, all uh, angel, uh, all startups with their slide deck. So once you start to apply online, you're going to be judged. If you get reached out for more information, you have to reply in a timely fashion. And your only objective once you start the process is to continue the conversation. That is really your only objective. So from Gust, you want to be tapped to be screened. All angel groups will pre-screen startups. The so Westchester Angels, we pre-screen eight startups in order to select the three that will pitch to our investors. From there, should you make it through the screening and make it through to the investor meeting, your only objective now is to continue the conversation and get into due diligence. That's when we really kick your tires um, and go into depth about you know, your background, your business plan. Uh, if you have revenue, we prefer to talk to clients because every startup thinks their platform or, or product is the best thing since sliced bread, and rightfully so. But market validation comes with revenue. That's how it happens. And then from there, should you make it through due, due, due diligence, then there's the dreaded document review. <laughs> and sometimes we see some stinking documents. And that's basically the process, uh, Elizabeth and Richard, uh, of the angel investing process. So can people in, um, approach a number of different angel groups? Like, let's say they go to you and think they're hitting all the New York groups. Can they go to New Jersey, Florida, Colorado, all at the same time? Yeah. So a uh, really good question. Thank you. So if you're going to raise, let's say, about a half a million dollars or a million dollars, we advise startups to raise enough money that will last them at least a year or a year and a half unless there's a significant trick, you're like getting a big deal that'll increase your valuation. Because raising money from angels is not easy. There's a gestation period. It's gonna take you months to raise money. And if you're raising half a million or a million, you're gonna to have to apply to many different angel groups. Angel groups might typically invest anywhere from 50 to 150, which is our sweet spot. Some angel groups can put more money in like some of the more prominent angel groups could put maybe a couple of hundred in or more, but we sympathize with the time it takes for startups to raise money. We advise startups to catch up on their sleep when they exit, because if you're the founder and you have a very small team, raising money from angels is going to take time away from you running your business. You really have to understand that it's not easy but there's a lot of money out there for the startups that uh, ha have a, a really good business plan and can solve a problem. Um, so we sympathize with that. Um, and we respect uh, startups at all times and add value at all times, whether we write a check out or not, we want to help startups succeed. And so different angel groups too have sort of different interests, right? Uh, some are socially oriented uh, in part, you know, for particular issues. Some are interested in tech. Some are interested in you know, uh, internet of things types of inventions. So some of them have you know, specialties. So it helps to do a little bit of research too on who you're going to be uh, pitching to because if you have a new consumer project and you're pitching to a tech group, you know, you may get a referral out of it, but you're, you're probably not going to get any money, right? Exactly right. You have to know the group and it helps you to understand the background of the group. 
and their their uh, their karma, if you will. Like the thirty seven angels, uh, they are a group of women investors. Uh, you have to be female. You have to be from Venus to be a member. They do <laughs> like a mixed C suites, um, and they have over a hundred hundred. 20 members now. The Golden Seeds, one of the more well-established angel groups, only invest in, in startups that have a, f- a female in the, in the C-suite. Um, you know, and the Gangels, I don't even know what to call the Gangels anymore. They are, they are the LGBTQ plus angel group. They do have an angel fund, but they become more of a, 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 a robust organization that is, is investing in and startups that are a little bit higher above the ladder over angel groups. But it's really important to know uh, who you're applying to so you can have an intelligent conversation. You know, check out their website, check out, you know, what their motivations are. Um, And Richard is right. Certain angel groups have certain industry focuses, like the Westchester Angels. We're industry agnostic, but we will not consider biotech or medical devices because we just don't have that expertise in our, in, in our membership. So Sandy, um, this is a burning question for a lot of people, I think. So how much money do you have to get from friends and family before an investor will look at you? Well, that varies. If you're fortunate enough to have friends and family that could kick in some money to get you bootstrapped and get started, you, you have that privilege and it is a privilege. Um, we don't really have a requirement if you are, um, um, you know, if you've raised some money from friends and family, that's great. If not, we don't hold, certainly will not hold that against you. More and more angel groups are looking away from pre-revenue companies because of the added risk involved. It adds more risk to an already risky investment. Mo- our sweet spot at the Westchester Angels are startups just coming up the right side of the hockey stick where there is some um, there is some revenue that's market validation. It de-risks the investment slightly that, you know, uh, there is some revenue there. We could actually talk to clients when we get into due diligence. So when let's let's take a, 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 an example where somebody has gotten to the uh due diligence stage, um, what kind of things do you look at that push you over the top and say, okay, we're gonna make an investment in this company? Right, so before I get into that, the most important thing when you create your slide deck is to create the slide deck from your audience's point of view, not yours. Just pretend you're sitting in the audience. You have a, a um, you know, you don't have that expertise in the food space or whatever. What do you want to hear from a, a, a pitch and a slide deck that's going to get you interested? Make sure you have the terms of your raise in there, an exit strategy, and we don't really want to hear that you were motivated in third grade to create this thing because you know uh, whatever, whatever, you know. Make sure it's from your audience's point of view. Um, the most important thing in, in due diligence, there's a couple of things, Richard. Number one, be 1,000% transparent. You know, once we get into due diligence, angels, we could smell stink a mile away. Um, if you're good at something, if you're not good at something, be honest with us because that's the only way we're going to be able to help fill in the blanks of what you're good at and what you're not good at. I always ask in due diligence for the founder, tell us what you're really good at, what you really stink at, where you need some help that we might be able to help you. The next thing is um, we need to see a business plan. Are you solving a problem or or are you creating another me too product, like another food uh, that's gonna go on whole food shelves or are you solving an industry problem? Uh, Angels really like to see startups that are solving some sort of problem out there and you would think by now all the problems have been solved in the world well no they haven't and we run into companies that are you know um for instance um solving a problem in an industry a lot of industries still you post use post-it pads and manila folders 
you know, we run into startups that are trying to automate those industries uh, from the back end. Um, and as the due diligence goes on, we're going to find out about your background. And another really important question we ask, and this is a difficult question, especially if the startup has a, a medical background and is creating a platform for, for office doctor's offices, or if you're an engineer and you don't have business experience, are you willing to step aside as you scale your company for another CEO that's an experienced business leader to, to take over the business? That's a really difficult question to ask, and it's a difficult question to answer. But what the answer to that um, tells investors what your motivation is. Is it about your ego, about your own self, or is your, is your main motivation to grow and scale this business? So those are some of the things that we look at. So can I follow up on that a little bit, Sandy? So um, let's say, okay. let's just pretend that Fireside got a bunch of money. That's my business. <laughs> I'm still doing friends and family, mostly family. <laughs> good. Well, you got a good family there right there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's say I admit, okay, I'm an analytical chemist by training. I never went to business school, whatever. So I'm going to bring in a CEO. And then what is my role? Do I stay on the board? Like, where do I go? I'm sorry, if, if you're the, the founder? So I'm the founder, but I realize that I am not like a business whiz. I get some big shot from Wharton who's going to come in and run the business for me, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so then where do I go? Do I go on the board? Do it it really depends upon the business and the structure and what the founder's strengths are. Um, the founder can't take a back seat. You know, the founder, this is personal. 99 times, it's a personal thing. And uh, if they onboard a CEO with business experience, the key is that found the, the new CEO and the founder have to mesh. They have to have a good relationship and the new CEO's talents have to mesh with what uh, the founder's experiences and what their weaknesses might be. So it's a team. You know, the founder's never just going to take a board seat and sit back and and have four, you know, maybe four uh, board of directors meetings a year. It's really about making a good fit to complement the founder on what they're weak at. That's great. So Haim had a quick question for you, Sandy, before we wrap sure. up this segment. Thank um, you, Haim. I'm just kind of curious, you know, we talked about fan, friends and family and sometimes uh, even showing a little bit of revenue. I know sometimes VCs look at successful crowdfunding um, uh, campaigns. Is that something you guys ever consider? What's your feeling on uh, people doing that beforehand? You know, if you want to crowdfund, God bless you. There's, uh, you know, this is not 30 years ago. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to raise money to get your company bootstrapped to get started, you know, friends and family first, if you want to do a crowdfunding uh, campaign to get money in the hopper, that's terrific, you know, how, but, you know, angels, you know, we don't crowdfund, you know, because there's no due diligence in crowdfunding, you know, so uh, should you apply to angels, the crowdfunding would be a separate conversation. Uh, I'm sorry, Sandy. I think I probably didn't, didn't state my question the right way. I meant, um, do you look at if somebody had done a successful crowdfunding campaign, uh, you know, like a Kickstarter as something to show proof of concept, to show the potential that there is a, 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 uh, a market for it, and then it's something that leads to maybe additional interest or possible interest from the angels? We take it with a grain of salt because there's not any due diligence with crowdfunding. You have people investing relatively small amounts of money. Um so we look at that as great, you know, you've got a friends and family or crowdfunding, but that's not going to interfere with the amount of due diligence that we do, um, you know, and by all means, you know, if you don't have friends and family that could kick in, you know, some zeros, why not crowdfund to get the ball off the ground? But the process time is still going to be the process for angels. That's not going to be interfered with with a crowdfunding campaign. Of, of course. All right. Thank you. Thank and you that was uh, a, a great question. And mm -hmm. we'll continue on with Passage to Profit after this commercial message. Welcome back, everybody. It's Passage to Profit, of course, with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. Our special guest this evening is Sandy Woolman, 
entrepreneur extraordinaire. And also with us is uh, Haim Letwin, who is a, a, pr a professor at Suffolk University and oversees their entrepreneurial program. Uh, welcome to the show, Haim. Oh, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's great to have you. So tell me what's going on in the entrepreneurial program at Suffolk. Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, our, our goal, so I am, I'm involved with both the uh, entrepreneurship department as well as the entrepreneurship center. And our goal is really just to expose as many students as possible to entrepreneurship and then get them out into the world and, and get them connected to that ecosystem that we have up here in, in Boston. So, you know, obviously the main goal is to educate students in entrepreneurship uh, and then to give them kind of an entrepreneurial mindset and some of the tools to be successful. But, you know, the big misconception that we really deal with uh, 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 upon entry for a lot of students is that entrepreneurship is only starting a business. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, starting a business is unbelievably entrepreneurial, and we have tons of students that do that, and we, we provide as much support to them as possible. We have two, two amazing entrepreneurial students with us today with Noah and Greta. Um, but you, know, you can also be very innovative and entrepreneurial within organizations also. So uh, at Suffolk, our main focus is really on this idea of value right? How we see valuable opportunities that others may not see, then how we measure the value behind that, protect that value, and actually uh, put that value into practice and, and value that other people might not see. And, you know, given that we're right in the heart of Boston and we have these uh, amazing ecosystem around us and phenomenal alumni, we really try to immerse our students into that ecosystem and get our alumni very involved with our students. So, you know, things that we do, we have lots of client focused classes, which are very experiential, where we bring in a, a organization, small businesses that have specific problems, and we try to deal with their specific problems or provide advice in real time. So try to work with them real time problems. Uh, that are actually happening. At, at the same time, do a lot of internships in downtown. We, we, we actually, some of the cool things that we did, we launched a crowdfunding class a couple of years ago where students actually crowdfunded uh, their idea. You know, a, a bunch of the students raised 10 plus thousand dollars to kind of get to the next step to, to get into an incubator or accelerator in town. We also do things where we take graduate students to Las Vegas to run a small businesses CES conference experience and all those types of things to really just immerse our students into um, in, into the ecosystem as much as possible. But that's really that's, on the, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say that's, that's, that's great. And, um, I, you know, I haven't heard in the past of universities getting so involved in entrepreneurship. Lots of times they have a center they have some classes in entrepreneurship, but you're actually launching entrepreneurs out into the world. Is that correct? I mean, what percentage of your students actually have entrepreneurism as their first job? Yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great question. So, I mean, um, you know, we we have 200 plus majors, and I think a, we're somewhere around. 16% that actually launch upon graduation a lot of or a lot of students end up in small businesses working <clears throat> excuse me alongside entrepreneurs or in larger organizations in kind of more of an entrepreneurship type setting and you know that's the that's the whole point right the major prepares them uh, to be able to see this value and work either launching something on their own or or hand in hand with entrepreneurs and at the same time we have the center and really the center is this conduit between the school as a whole and, and the business community. So what we try to do there, the main goal is to get our students sitting next to learning from, you know, people, people like Sandy, you know, the, the really experienced, thoughtful people who understand different industries and have conversations with them. So, you know, give you some ideas of the stuff that we've done. Um, FinTech Week in Boston, we, we, we host some events with them. We had this really interesting cannabis panel where we brought in uh, the uh, director of the cannabis. <laughs> I, bet, I, bet, I bet that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, does anybody it, remember what happened <laughs> in the panel? <laughs> it, it was a it was an amazing event, to, and and you know, um, we we brought in the 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 first and only director of the cannabis control commission up here in Massachusetts, and I think what I didn't realize was just how entrepreneurial of an industry this is. I mean, this is one of those industries that is just absolutely blowing up. And, you know, along with Suffolk's 
goal of really focusing on inclusion and diversity, the cannabis industry is all about uh, inclusion and diversity. It, it's just a, a very unique industry that I, I didn't know much about until we had this panel. But you know, so- um, Yeah, Haim, I wanted to just make a comment. Sure. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. But it's interesting that you say you're going beyond entrepreneurism because one thing that we did with the show last year was we thought, you know, we want to expand to innovation. So innovation doesn't just happen for entrepreneurs. It happens for entrepreneurs. It happens for the type of people that you're talking about. And then the innovation can spur entrepreneurism, right? I think they kind of go hand in hand. Um, So it's really interesting that you're kind of expanding this world out. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, we think about it as multiple tracks. We have a launch track for students that would, would launch, but we also have a corporate entrepreneurship for uh, track for people who really expect to be within an organization thinking about innovation, thinking about kind of driving those next ideas forward in a, in a larger organization. Yeah. And we're here with uh, Kenya. Kenya, the media maven from iHeart Radio has just joined us. Who Kenya. does that within iHeart, by the way, she has been so innovative for us. Thank you, Kenya. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to co-create with you. I, I am enjoying this conversation. And I'm just curious, how much do you think entrepreneurship is an innate trait? And how much of it do you think is teachable? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. And I'd have to dig back into my PhD program, research, uh, thought, uh, the research that I read in my PhD program to think about that a little bit more. But there were some really interesting twin studies um, where they looked at some of this stuff. And, and I think it's, you know, like everything, it's a, big, a mixture of, of nurture and nature. And it's interesting. We work with some students who just are clearly just so unbelievably entrepreneurial. But on the other hand, there's students who they know this is what they want to do and they work really hard at learning the different tools and learning the mindsets. And so again, I, I kind of think it's a little bit of both. That's a that's a great comment. Sandy, do you have any thoughts or questions for Heim? You know, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's really terrific that uh, we're seeing more and more entrepreneurial tracks and programs in higher education because uh, that's certainly a track. There's so many uh, graduates of colleges that really have an idea. And that's the time when you graduate, that's the time that you can really express yourself because heaven forbid you fail, you could always recreate yourself. You're young enough to fail. Um, We see this here in New York. Um, uh, In New Rochelle, Iona has a track. Uh, There's Pace University in our area has entrepreneurial tracks, and we're seeing it more and more pop out throughout the country. And you could actually get a a major in in entrepreneurial, uh, you know, entrepreneurialism, if you will. (laughs) And I think it's just a really good alternative for for those uh, graduates that don't want to go into corporate America and want to do things on their own. And most of the colleges, they only provide education. They provide access to actual investors. And uh, listen, there's a thriving angel uh, space in the Boston area that I know really well. And I think it's just fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm dating myself a, a little bit here, but I graduated from college in 1982. And the definition of a successful career at that point was to get a job at a big company and claw your way up to the top, whether you liked it or whether you didn't, you know? And it took me a long time to find myself and to learn that that wasn't what was making me happy. What I wanted to do was go out and create. And I think this generation is much more aware of wanting to find meaning and passion in their work. And rather than just put up with the grind and claw their way to the top, they want to do something that they're going to find enjoyable. So the expectations are a lot higher now, and but I'm glad to see it. I think it's it, it, it benefits everybody if people are doing something that they enjoy. I think that's so true. And I, and I got to say, I think one of the neat things about uh, an entrepreneurship program in college is the other areas that the students can kind of connect with. So, you know, our law school works with our entrepreneurship students to help them think about IP, our design school 
uh, works with them in regard to creating trademarks and stuff. So it's, it's kind of seeing how all these pieces fit together. I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited that I'm living in a time when I can get a PhD in this area and be able to teach students who are interested in this area because it's, it's one of the most exciting things to go to school and hear passionate young people wanting to drive their businesses forward. Absolutely. So where do they get the creativity? Do you help them develop the creativity to come up with new ideas or do people just flock to the program because they're naturally creative? What do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, when we think about creation and discovery, we definitely think about how do you journal ideas to be looking at the different possible ideas out there? How do you use divergent and convergent thinking, uh, you know, use design thinking? How do we go about the ideation process first to think about potential ideas and then actually moving those forward to see if they're valuable and they can become a business. You know, one thing I will say is there are definitely some students who just come in knowing they want to start this. And then typically from there, we pivot and we meander and we figure out kind of what that really looks like in the end, but they're pretty much so based on their core idea. And then there's other students who just kind of look around and see all sorts of different ideas and slowly narrow down until they find what really fits for them. That's an amazing process. And it's it's very interesting, uh, Haim, to hear you discuss it because different people do appreciate approach creativity uh, in different ways, but they're all uh, creative. Uh, Kenya, speaking of creativity. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm just listening and, and I'm curious to know, like, so if someone comes in to your program, like, what should they expect? Like, it's as far as like the first phase of classes or like, do you kind of customize your courses for them to take? Like, how does it work? It's a great question. So, I mean, it, you know, it is a it, we have a majors and we have minors for our majors. They take all the general education requirements that any business school student would take to get all the you know basic knowledge that they would need. And then, you know, our, our, to, I'll give you kind of the breakdown or the way our classes are set up is we have a four course core that every entrepreneurship student takes. And this is all focused on that idea of value that we talked about before. The first one is ideation. And we talked about creating value. The second one is measuring value. This is where we put the, a lot of the finance uh, behind it. The third one's protecting and presenting value. So I, uh, I teach that one and we talk about some of the IP and stuff behind that. And then the last one is one of these um, uh, really experiential courses where we bring in businesses and our students work hand in hand with them to try to come up with some value they're going to create for them and then actually execute that. And then beyond those four courses, they take three electives and the electives can either be in a very specific area, like we have a family business uh, a track where it's all focused on family business. Uh, we have a launch track that's all focused on launch, or they can take different businesses or I'm sorry, different entrepreneurship classes, uh, just kind of to learn different areas. So, you know, green classes, the crowdfunding class, we have internships, all sorts of different opportunities, depending on the specific student. And, and you know, the other thing is I, I'm a firm believer that if, you know, if, if you're a finance major and accounting major, having an entrepreneurial background, having a minor or a few classes in entrepreneurship really gives you a way, I can see Sandy nodding, really gives you a way <laughs> to take that functional, that other functional knowledge and, and do something valuable with it. So, you know, it's, it's just trying to expose as many people to this, these mindsets as possible. Right. And I, you know, I think I'm kind of curious, uh, once we get out into the world, mm -hmm. it's not always as easy or as fair <laughs> as we hope it would be, right? And when you're an entrepreneur, you are right in there interfacing directly with the real world. If you're working for a large company, you're sheltered a little bit. You have to deal with the internal politics, but you don't have to worry about a reporter asking you a question and then in publicly embarrassing yourself, <laughs> right? They don't let you do that, but they do let entrepreneurs do that, right? So, um, I guess, is there a way that you can kind of prepare students for the rough and tumble of the business world? Yeah, I mean, we put them in. So we have our pitch competitions. We had an IP pitch competition, a regular pitch competition in our actual classes. We bring it. Well, so in there, we have angels and business people tearing them up. Well, tearing them apart is maybe not the nicest way. To put it. <laughs> but being critical, you know, of, of their ideas, we, we go through a coaching process and then they get up and they pitch to these, you know, 
people just like Sandy, um, who, you know, are focused on really diving into the details and making sure that they, um, they understand where in the real world they're going to be pushed. So it's, it's a little bit of tough love, but it's, it's definitely preparing them for those outcomes. One thing I did want to mention, I know Sandy mentioned how it's, it's great that we're talking about this at the at the college level, but what's, what is ex- even more exciting to me is so I've spent some time going to some high school classes now, a boys and girls club, junior achievement. And now we're starting to even talk about these types of things at the, you know, seventh, eighth grade level. And certainly in high school, because, you know, this is something that certainly in my high school career, we never talked about. And I think it's so important that we're starting to talk about innovation, design thinking, an entrepreneurial mindset much earlier on. So it's not the first time you see it is in college. It's interesting how it's filtering down. Absolutely. Sandy, uh, I saw you making some gestures earlier. Was there something you wanted to pitch in with? No, I think uh, Heim's on the right track. You know, it's um, there's so many opportunities for uh, young graduates these days. It, it's I think it's just fantastic. Yeah, and I think it's pointing us in a, a new direction in terms of how people think about work and uh, how people, you know, think about themselves. Uh, entrepreneurism uh, gives you freedom. It gives you freedom to decide what you want to do, how much time you want to put in. Freedom to fail on your own terms. Freedom to fail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then pick it up and start over again. <laughs> right. And, and also, you know, who you work with what your projects are, you know, and how much money you make, right? Yeah. Depending on your, your skills and your abilities, right? And so there's there's not a ceiling. What, Sandy, you're going to... I was just going to say, you know, the most important thing for entrepreneurs to learn getting out of the, out of the classroom that's going to teach them practical experiences, business is 100% about people. You know, yeah. so the most important thing you could do as you start this for Greta and Noah that are starting a business is to surround yourself with the right people, either advisors, accountants, attorneys, or employees. And the most important thing is to get rid of the people. I won't use the, the terminology that's prevalent, but get rid of the people that are not going to help you very, very quickly. It only takes one person to stink up the whole room you know and and you know this is a really good thing the technology is a really good thing but it will never substitute for shaking a person in the hand and looking them in the face business is about people and as you scale you're going to run into clients that are difficult you have to understand how to deal with people you know Stephen Jobs didn't start Apple by himself he started it. He surrounded himself with the right people. You know, if I can, one thing that I, I find so fascinating, actually exactly what Sandy is saying is, you know, in the classroom, the theory, uh, you know, students, students are students. They, they're typically very comfortable learning about that stuff. But when we get out into networking events or in pitch competitions or when we take our class out to CES um, and they're face to face, shaking hands, meeting people in the community. It's definitely some of the biggest learning moments and very intimidating for a lot of students. And, and that's why I think it's so important that in, in all education, part of what we provide is that opportunity to get them out into the real world, to be talking to people, to be comfortable talking to people. That's great. And unfortunately, we have to stop here for a commercial. We have but- to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be right back with more Passage to Profit after this. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's been an amazing passage to profit with our special guest, uh, Sandy Woolman. And also we have with us our, for our executive spotlight, Haim Letwin, who runs the Entrepreneurial Center at uh, Suffolk University, among other things. Um, we're gonna have our presentations coming up in just a minute, but before we do that, uh, I'd like to uh, ask Kenya, what is our Power Move segment for this evening? Well, thank you, Richard and Elizabeth. So for Power Move today, we're going to talk about Kevin Hart. I don't know if you caught him on the recent Shark Tank episode. I love him. No, I didn't, but yeah. He was on Shark Tank last week or this past week, and he was one of their guest hosts. And while he was on there, he had kind of given some new information about, well, not new information. I think he's been doing it for a while, but he highlighted his own heartbeat productions company 
that he started. So basically, you know, he's been an entertainer. He's been a comedian for quite a while now. And he's a full on creator now with his own production studio. So he was talking about that on the show. And I thought that that was a nice power move and a nice level up from where he started. And it's always great to have the creative rights to anything that you're producing and the opportunity to have your own production company and have true ownership. So we're all about owning our own intellectual property and owning everything that we create. So I thought it was a good power move for today. Yeah, he is so funny that you wouldn't really think he would be that smart, but you have to be smart to be funny, right? I think he's very entrepreneurial. Right. We were having this conversation about, you know, just so he's being not entrepreneur- smart. <laughs> well, he's, well, he's smart. He's definitely smart. I think you have to be smart to be an entrepreneur. And he's also very funny. But I think to Elizabeth's point is sometimes when, you know, you think somebody is like all very entertainment focused and they have this gift to make people laugh like you don't you wouldn't necessarily think that there would be this underlying, I don't know, entrepreneurialism that's there. But I think that when you're a creator, it, it kind of goes hand in hand. And a lot of us creatives who, you know, tend to want to do things on the entertainment side also have that creative bug and the entrepreneurial spirit that kind of makes everything work cohesively for us. And I think he's one of those people. Yeah. And by the way, I'm totally down with your statement that people should own their IP. I think that is, <laughs> um, you know, I have to uh, I, I have to applaud that direction for sure. So you should put that on a shirt. Own your own, own your IP, own your own IP. Well, I, I, I can't because you own the rights to it. You came up with it. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take a license, I guess. <laughs> so Elizabeth. Fireside. Yeah, Fireside. So for those of you who don't know, Fireside is a small business directory, a video directory of small businesses. And I am using cutting edge marketing techniques to interview small business owners and help them rise above the crowd in digital advertising and using their videos to help consumers hire the right person, not the person that reminds them of that yucky guy who sits in the next cubicle. There you go. So (laughs) that's Fireside. Uh, How's it been going? It's good. I joined a business advisory group. It's a peer advisory group. We sit on a peer board. uh, And um, I I think the people there have some great ideas for me. And I'm able to give them some ideas too. You know, everybody's starting a podcast these days. So Richard and I have been doing this for over three years. So we kind of got a little bit of it under our belt. Almost four years. It'll be four years and soon. Hard to believe. So yeah, so it's a great uh, place to exchange ideas. And I do have a lot of respect for the people in my group. Yeah, and I think that underscores an important point that it's always good to talk with other people, whether it's in in a group, whether it's in a mentor situation, but getting input and feedback on what you're doing and how you're doing it is, you know, critical. So uh, awesome that you found a group that you can connect with. Yeah, some of these uh, guys are a little older and they have had incredible careers and they really understand business. And so, you know, to Sandy's point earlier and maybe Haim too, I asked them, I said, do you really think this is something people want? Is this a good idea to pursue? Because as an entrepreneur, if they had said, no, not really, I would have, Richard had an incredible idea when we were on vacation. I would have said, okay, I'm moving on to the next thing, right? But I did get validation from them. So that made me feel a lot better about spending any money on it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's good. And um, of course, any kind of feedback like that is is always welcome. So, so on to our presenters who have been waiting patiently. I love college students. You know, I, college was some of the best time of my life, and I am so happy that you guys are getting to do such exciting things. So, it is my pleasure to introduce Noah Trofimo, and I think I know where the name for your company came from. But after you tell us what you're doing, I want you to explain the name. So, his company is Paper Bag Mask foundation.org. And please tell us all about it, Noah. Hi. So first off, thank you so much for having me. This is such a cool experience. Um, But to tell you a little bit about the Paper Bag Mask Foundation, um, it's a 501c3 nonprofit helping young people with uh, stress and anxiety by building confidence in themselves and their ability to cope with stressors. Uh, So to do this, we offer holistic um, classes revolving around research-backed pillars for use as a supplement to traditional treatments or as a preventative measure. 
And so far we've hosted over 100 virtual and in-person classes, um, as well as coordinating several um, community service projects. And I'm personally passionate about this mission because I've had my own mental health struggles in the past and I've been anxious, I've been depressed and even suicidal. Um, and I know firsthand how important it is to have additional um, treatments um, on top of mental health, the, the existing mental health treatments. And, you know, there's a few problems of why I, I'm, I'm also pushing this business is that first off, treatment isn't one size fits all. So unlike having a broken arm where there's a, a surefire way to treat it, Mental health is a lot more different, so it can take months, even years to find a treatment plan that works because you're working with therapists, you're working with different medications, and it's a very time consuming process. So my goal is to kind of offer classes um, while people are creating treatment plans. Um, there's also anxiety and stress affect people from a variety of backgrounds and circumstances, so not everyone is able to participate in traditional treatments. Uh, there's also a stigma surrounding mental health. And lastly, I'm targeting young people specifically because teenage years through young adult years are, it's a transitional period. So you're leaving, moving out of your parents' house for the first time, you're going to school, you're starting relationships, you're kind of trying a lot of new things. And that can be a really exciting time, but it can also be really scary. Absolutely. I know when my daughter went off to college, they had two full-time psychiatrists for free for the students <laughs> on campus. And of course they couldn't see everybody. And maybe some no. people didn't want to go to them and didn't want to be seen walking in there. Like you said, the stigma. So I think this is wonderful what you're doing. So how did you Thank get you so the, much. yeah. How'd you get the name? Was it the paper bag over the head? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's it. So the name symbolizes, well, first off, we all know someone that has a mental illness. There's one in five people have a mental illness. And the thing is, not all of us are open about having mental health issues. So myself included, when I was struggling, I never opened up because I didn't want to seem like a burden to my friends or my family. And I just didn't want to be treated differently. So I kept it in and I wore this fake mask and my fake smile, which it's pretty much putting a paper bag over my head and just putting a fake smile on it. That's, uh, that's really powerful. What are some of the topics that you cover in your classes? Sure. So the three pillars are uh, movement, creativity, and meditation. So we host different art classes, different exercise classes, uh, breath work mindfulness things like that that's what that's 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 really great and is it mostly students at suffolk or have you captured a wider audience yes so it's people all around the world um and not specifically uh students but but suffolk we've worked directly with so we've hosted classes in person for suffolk students um as well as virtually um, specifically for suffolk students We've also worked with a couple other nonprofit organizations to put on stuff for their audience. Um, and, and students is definitely our, our target area because I, I'd love to ideally be working with partnering with other schools like Suffolk and, and offering our resources directly to their students. But Coach Hanya, uh, any, any thoughts or questions? Yeah, I mean, I, when you were speaking earlier and you were talking about your target being students, I was thinking about everything that's been going on statistically with COVID. And a lot of younger people who are really having a really bad experience with this, you know, obviously the change in routine and, you know, kind of being cooped up and not really having that regular pattern of life. Um, how do you see this is fitting into an overall solution for even teenagers? Because I know a lot, I, I saw some uneasy statistical rates that the, the rate of suicide amongst teens is much higher um, as COVID has impacted us all. So I just was curious to see what your, your strategy is in regards to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just isolation in general is not healthy for, for anyone's mental health, but especially young people that are, are so used to seeing their friends and relying on socializing. Um, but I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that question again? Sure. I just was curious in terms of like the platform that you're building, like how you feel that that's like a solution to everything that's going on with the rise of COVID and, and sure. what strategies you may be implementing to kind of combat some of those things. Sure. So um, my, my plan for that is pretty much this concept of active coping. So for me personally, when I was really struggling, 
something that I noticed was that I didn't feel like I was in control of my life. And as soon as I started picking up these habits, um, which are actually these three pillars that I emphasize, I started noticing I felt more in control and I felt like I was an active participant rather than taking my medication and not doing anything to be personally attached to my, my therapy. So uh, that aspect of just habit change in general is something that I find really um, important to teach people because we can teach, we can give someone um, like therapy and, and medication, but even when I was doing that, I didn't feel better. So it's something to supplement that. So you can do that and then also be going to an exercise class or an art class on top of that. So just actively, just honestly attacking it from a, a multi-pronged approach. Okay, Sandy? Yeah, well, no, I have to congratulate you on, on taking the initiative to solve a problem. Thank you. you know, any person that starts a business from personal experience, it's business, but now this is personal. You know, we're no strangers. You said one in five have challenges. You know, my son, when he was a freshman, lost three friends in six months, two to drug overdose. And they were on my, they were, those kids were on my little league team. You know, so we understand that. And most people think that a 501c3, oh, it's a nonprofit. You know what? A 501c3 is just another type of a business model. It's running a business you know, your source of funding would be different than if you were a C Corp looking for angel investment, et cetera, et cetera. But it's even more highly scrutinized by the government um, because there's a lot of fraud out there. You know, I had a 501c3 before I started the Westchester Angels when my financial planets became aligned and we helped small businesses and I self-funded it because I don't, I don't want to ask anybody for money. But running a 501c3 you have to have board meetings. You have to take notes. Um, it's a it's a more complicated business actually than running a C corp. So um, I commend you for for taking a personal experience and turning a, a really bad negative into a huge positive. I applaud you, my friend. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, the the whole experience so far has been extremely rewarding. Like they. I, the, the monetary compensation, I work completely volunteer, but there's compensation in other ways that are, are so much more rewarding. Like just knowing that I'm directly helping people has been something that it, it motivates me to constantly keep working on this. That's great. That's really great. And, uh, and, and, and a, a lot of passion and, and you can, you can think about all the people that you've supported and helped during this process and you're having a real impact. So, uh, you know, hats off. And that's, that's, that's really uh, amazing. Yeah, and I do think you're taking a slightly different approach than other places that I've seen because you're using movement, you're using different things. And, and so you're associating the fact that like, sometimes if someone's depressed or feeling really down, if you just get up and go run around the block, you're going to feel a lot better. Right. Or you go, do some moves from some yoga moves or something like just getting your body flowing helps a lot. So it seems like you've brought together your three pillars, which I'm not sure I've seen exactly that anywhere else. Yeah, that's, it's pretty cool. As long as you don't like twist your ankle when you're running around the block. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Haim, did you have a question for your student? You know, I actually was kind of hoping I could get no one, because I know, especially when COVID first hit, what, what, what um, Coach Kenny was talking about, uh, I think Noah did a tremendous amount of online courses, really reaching out much more broadly. And I just was kind of wondering if no, it might be worthwhile for Noah to talk or tell a little bit about that experience um, and how you were able to use different mediums to, to also get your business, uh, get you, get your, your, you know, your product across. Yeah, definitely. So with, with COVID initially, when we launched, it was, everything was locked down. So our virtual classes were kind of the only medium we had for, for getting attendance. Um, and then as things opened up, we, we did that for several months. And then when things started opening up, we noticed that people were zoomed out and no longer wanted to be doing virtual stuff. And, and we had to pivot to offer in-person stuff right away. So then we started emphasizing in-person classes a lot more and just constantly checking with COVID because the, the restrictions are changing so frequently that it's been, oh, now, now people want more virtual classes. So kind of finding balance between 
safety following state regulations while also making sure we're offering the classes that people need and want. Um, so it is has been a variety of in person as well as um, virtual classes, but um, yeah, the, specifically with with Suffolk doing in person classes, there's something that can't be replaced. Like the virtual offerings are great because it's removes a lot of the barriers to getting somewhere. It's it's free. It's easy to just just sign on to your laptop and join a class. Um, so it's removing those barriers, but the aspect of socializing and community. Um, it's just something that can't be replaced. So in person is still a, a very important part. Well, and what I find interesting about that is, you know, kind of the need is the mother of all innovation to some extent here, you find yourself in this situation, I, you know, it kind of opens different potential markets or different ways to deliver your service. And it must have been an interesting experience going through that. Yeah, it's definitely been the last few years um, a lot of changing the business model and figuring out what works and figuring out what what people what types of classes people want and also just things like like an like exercise class is pretty simple to host virtually because you just need an instructor people can use body weight but things like the art classes were a little bit more difficult because people need supplies so not everyone on a zoom call will have the same supplies so just figuring out things like that like how we can get creative with supplies that everyone has or, or sending supplies beforehand so just trying to figure out logistics um, over the last few years and ultimately getting to classes that we continue to do that have been easy to to host virtually or in person and that, this is excellent. I applaud you. We, we're going to have to end this segment now, but you also have a clothing line. Is that right? Yeah. So the nonprofit actually started off as a clothing brand because my, my goal was to help. I just wanted to spread awareness to that concept of the paper bag mask and wearing a fake smile and also donating a, a portion of proceeds to mental health charities. But over time, I thought about it and I was like, how can I make the largest positive impact. And I, I thought that I could do that by starting a nonprofit instead. Um, so I pivoted and then created a, a nonprofit to, to spread the same message. Excellent. So people can find you at paperbagmaskfoundation.org. Yep. And there's a store there where they can buy your clothing, right? Yep. Excellent. So uh, hopefully you'll get a lot of people going online and see what you're doing after this. Awesome. So Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to have to go to a break. So listeners, you are listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of New York. We will be right back. Well, welcome back, listeners. Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, our special guest, Sandy Woldman from Westchester Angels. We have had a fabulous show so far. We're not done yet. But if you miss the beginning, it comes out on our podcast tomorrow on all the major podcast channels. And our podcast is doing really, really well, by the way. So, yeah, so uh, please download it like crazy. So the numbers will keep increasing. <laughs> okay. Shameless plug for the show, but let's continue. Um, now we are to our second student presenter. I am so excited about this. Greta Thurston with Study Buddies Tutors. And this is not just another tutoring site. She goes way beyond that. So I am so excited to hear what you're doing, Greta. Welcome. Thank you so much. This has been awesome so far. Um, but yeah, I started Study Buddies Tutors in the fall of 2020. So I was home over COVID back in Colorado. And what Study Buddies is, is it's an online tutoring and academic mentoring company where we pair up middle and high school students with current college students. And the idea behind that is that there's much more of a cohesive relationship there. You're closer in age, college students, especially with online learning, we're experiencing a lot of the struggles that high school students are experiencing as well with now having to do all of our classes online, homework, time management, and things like that. And it just creates a much more accountable and, like I said, cohesive relationship between the students where high school and middle school students have this mentor that they can look up to in the college tutor and mentor that they have with, with study buddies. And how the idea came about was I'm very involved in a youth organization called 4-H. I uh, don't know if you've heard about it, but it's the largest youth organization in the world and it's very focused on youth development. So I grew up in 4-H and then after I aged out, I started volunteering for the organization. And I was working with a lot of middle, middle school and high school students and their parents were coming up to me after I was doing horseback riding lessons or 
teaching at conferences and asking about if I could tutor their student in the next academic year, because what they wanted was to have somebody working with their student who their student looked up to or who their child looked up to. So they were really looking for a mentor. They weren't coming to me because of some crazy academic achievement that I have achieved, but because I was working with their child and their child really enjoyed working with me, looked up to me, felt comfortable working with me. And I had quite a few parents ask me about this. And so that got me thinking that this was a need that a lot of parents were looking for. And there's only one of me, but I could start something that would be able to bring this to a lot more middle and high school students, and then also create fulfilling and flexible em employment for college students. Wow, that's great. I can certainly see why parents would want their high school students to work with you, Greta. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure you would teach them a, a lot and you seem to have a great perspective. So uh, congratulations on your company. I think it's yeah. wonderful. So do you think that these students that are getting this tutoring would have stayed in school anyway? Or do you think that your college students are helping these kids stay in school? So I think it's a little bit of both. We've definitely worked with some very high achieving students and it's great because we can pair them up with like-minded college students. So recently we had a high school girl who is really interested in STEM and engineering, which is a, a field that there's not a lot of female students in. And so one of our tutors, one of our study buddies, she is also currently enrolled in one of the top engineering schools in the country. And so we paired them up together and it was a great match because now this high school student gets to see somebody exactly where she wants to be in a year, two years from now and gets to work and learn from that. On the flip side, working with college students could also help students that are maybe less high achieving and are actually struggling to you know, keep up with their homework, do their time management. Maybe they're struggling with online and they can see this college student who also going through similar things, working online, figuring out how to manage their time when it's completely their own, they're at home, things like that, and can actually inspire them to go to school and, and go to college. That's really great. Kenya? Well, I you kind of answered my question already, Greta, but this is phenomenal because I have a 16-year-old who is actually interested in STEM and engineering, and we're looking at schools now, and, you know, kind of we don't really have a great idea of, like, where she wants to go, but, you know, are, are kind of learning what's out there opportunity-wise. I guess my other question for you would be in terms of where you'd like to see this scale to, are you looking to how many universities are you looking to have under your belt? Like how much representation from all the student mentors are you looking to scale to eventually? That's a great question. And with it being online right now, that the possibilities are essentially endless. It started out very broad, actually. I, I As I mentioned, I'm from Colorado. So it started in Colorado in the community that I grew up in. I was working with people that I knew, working with the school district that I knew. And then being in college, I have a very large network of college students that I can bring on as my initial mentors. And that was great, but then I moved full-time to Massachusetts. So now I'm a Massachusetts resident and I've been almost starting over a little bit here because there's a different product market fit, a different pricing structure, things like that, because the needs are different in Massachusetts than they are in Colorado. And so to answer your question about scalability, right now we actually took a very broad model to start with and we're shrinking it down and we're starting in just a single community here in Massachusetts to really dial in and focus what we need. So I reached out to one person in one town after a lot of market research in Quincy, Massachusetts, and we've been working with the Chamber of Commerce there, um, the school board also working with a mentor there. So the, the goal now is to shrink it, make it really fit, work out all the kinks, see what parents and students really need, and then grow from there. So the idea would be to get as many universities and reach as many students across the country as we can. Great. So I have a question. Do you foresee that you're going to pursue this then after you graduate? Yes, definitely. That is that is the goal. Excellent. Great. Sandy, do you have a comment or question? Yeah, Greta, you know, again, just like Noah, you've created a business from personal experience, and that's always terrific. So if I may wear my angel hat for a moment, uh, are you looking to scale your business to sell it? No, I haven't really considered that as an option. 
I think that, yeah, with tutoring, it's a, it's a very big industry. There's lots of tutoring companies in the industry. And I've talked about this with Haim before, but the idea itself isn't necessarily, uh, it's repeatable. Somebody could take it and do it on their own. Um, So I think that the value that we bring is like making sure that the mentors are really strong mentors, making sure that the study buddy's name means strong mentorship and these college students creating these inspirational relationships with middle and high school students. So, you know, the only way angel investors make money is if we invest in a company and they scale it for an exit. That's we make money on the exit. So if you're looking for funding, angels would not be the best place to go. But as Chaim mentioned, you know, there's a lot of different places to raise money. Crowdfunding would be a really good opportunity for you to raise money. Um, But you have a very fluid business because your mentors are going to grow up and you're going to constantly have to replace your mentors. So it's going to be a lot of of elbow work in your business because it's going to be a very fluid business. Yes, definitely. Uh, it, it has only been around for a couple of years, so we haven't experienced a lot of turnover, but creating the model the way we did, I, I knew going into it that there will be a lot of turnover and creating relationships with universities and finding those really solid college students is going to be very important. That's the key. You mentioned it right there, is to make sure you screen your mentors properly to make sure they have the proper mindset and the expertise in the area uh, that they are going to be mentoring. You know, and this is going to separate you from the Khan Academies of the world. Mm-hmm. It's a personal relationship that you're going to create with the mentor and the student. And that personal relationship is, uh, you know, will get you referrals as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Haim, did you have any uh, questions or comments for your student? It, you know, one thing I love about um, Greta's model is this Slack resource model, you know, he's kind of be the Uber of tutoring for lack of a, for lack of a better description, is how you really are able to potentially create a repeatable process where once you're able to set up a screening process uh, that is almost automated, maybe not automated, but more automated, you'll be able to bring in, I think, have the potential to bring in lots of uh, tutors and screen them in a much in an efficient way and then offer this service to lots of people. And, you know, the other comment I kind of have for it, I'm, and I guess I'm curious uh, if, you know, if Greta thought about some of these other models that kind of do this, where they look at Slack resources when you put this together initially. Slack resources, meaning completely I mean, automated on the computer. Well, Slack resources, you know, uh, where we have Uber people who have spare time in a car. So they have this resource and they can drive people around or, or you know, uh, vacation rental by owner where I have an empty vacation home and it's not being used. So somebody else can use it, you know, it, 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 so it, it kind of leads to this ability where, you know, we have college students who have this knowledge and have this ability to mentor and they have maybe some time depending on their schedule. So did you think about some of those prior models have used that successfully when putting this together? Yeah, definitely. It was meant to be very flexible. So the college students, they create their own schedules, they put in their availability, they tell us exactly what they're able to contribute. And then that's, that's what we expect nothing more from them. So it definitely was meant to be very flexible and very cohesive with a college student schedule, which is often very hectic and busy. And if I could share one, one other comment, I think it's really interesting. And this goes to show how I continue to learn as I as I'm a professor. You know, when, when I first heard this idea from Greta, I must admit, you know, I'm always open to any idea. But my first initial reaction internally was, well, would I really want a college student when I could have somebody else? maybe who's a professor uh, being the being the uh, tutor and um, as I spent some time with the high school organizations that I work with, I learned very quickly that this peer mentoring is just so much more powerful and so, so much, so, so important as part of the process. So, you know, as we went through it, I, I, you know, it goes to show how much you learn working with, uh, with the students on these businesses. That's really great. Unfortunately, we are at the end of this uh, segment. And so um, we're going to take a commercial break. And we'll be back with more Passage to Profit right after this. But before we go, Greta, can you tell us how people can get in touch with you? Absolutely. So the best way is to go to the website, 
which is studybuddiestutors.com. And all of the information you need, how to find a tutor, all of our tutors are also listed on there. Sounds great. So we'll be back after this. What an amazing show this has been. I mean, I have learned so much and I have been uh, so inspired, especially uh, by our presenters today who really showed us the way the world is going and are, are leading the way. Well, Sandy's always great to have on the show. And I met Jaime actually through a mutual friend and thought he would be awesome as he has been and his Absolutely. students as well. So yeah, I've really enjoyed our show today. And of course, Kenya is here. So that always makes it better. It always makes it better. So if you're just tuning in, our podcast comes out tomorrow and you'll see us on YouTube. So just tuning in, it's too late. You missed it. <laughs> <laughs> but well, you can hear it on our podcast. Yes. Yeah, so our guest was Sandy Woolman, co-founder and managing director of Westchester Angels, an angel investment group that helps people that are starting their businesses and getting them going, take them the next step further. And he's a singer and a songwriter too. He, he, he's bashful about that. But oh, we should have had him sing on the show next, next time. time. <laughs> no, I, I don't want anybody to leave. I could clear a crowded room in a matter of minutes if I sit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is not the proper rock star <laughs> attitude. So. So, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta live the role, yeah. man. So you can, you, you can find him at westchesterangels.com. He's also on LinkedIn, Sandy Woolman, W O. L L M A N and Sandy, like Sandy Beach. <laughs> so, easy you. to spell. <laughs> um, and then we had Heim Letwin, who is a director of entrepreneurship, associate professor of management and entrepreneurship at Suffolk University in Massachusetts. Obviously, a very bright and inspiring teacher. I wish I had somebody like Heim mentoring me when I was in college. I know. I know. I was so impressed when I met him uh, the first time. And, and again today. Yeah. And so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, you can find him at the so Suffolk, S-U-F-F-O-L-K dot E-D-U website. So you go to the faculty and it's C-H-A-I-M dash L-E-T-W-I-N, Heim Letwin, if you want to find out more about him and uh, the wonderful work that he's doing. And then he, we had two of Heim's students, Noah Trofimo, who had paperbagmaskfoundation.org, helping kids his age or young adults his age I should say navigate the challenges of today's world in a very creative way I really like his three pillars yeah and I will never look at paper bags the same way again every time I go into the grocery store I'm going to be thinking of Noah and my anxiety so I'm going to get you one to put over your head no I'm just kidding um, oh, oh, right in the heart and then we had Greta Thurston with study buddies tutors um just like it sounds study buddies b-u-d-d-i-e-s tutors.com which sounds like a tutoring program but is way beyond that it's more of a mentorship program and it's just amazing it's got it's like a white glove type of program she's very discerning in who she matches up to work together and in vetting the people the college students that she uses for this yeah it's such a great idea uh and uh, i bet they really do become buddies so aptly named and we had kenya gibson with us we love our coach kenya kenya gibson with a p kenya gibson at iheartmedia.com one of the most creative people I have ever met in my life. She did the logo for Passage to Profit. She came up with the idea for the show. She's helped us with other things. And um, if you have marketing needs, digital marketing needs, you want to get an ad on iHeart or you want to talk to her about any appearances or anything, Kenya's the person to help you. And how do people find you, Kenya? Oh, they can reach me via email. It's Kenya Gibson with a P G I P S O N at iHeartMedia.com. Awesome. So um, we're getting to the end of the show, but before we do, uh, I'd like a few words of wisdom from our uh, guest this evening. Sandy, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, Richard and Elizabeth, thank you for the uh, privilege to be on your show again. I'm very grateful. And uh, it's really terrific to meet two outstanding young entrepreneurs. And for when you're a student, uh, you know, there's two things that shine out. One is the passion and one is the education that you've received in order to relay your message properly. So kudos to Chaim for, for running a really good program because the quality of the entrepreneur is directly related to the quality of the teaching. 
So congratulations for running a terrific program. And I wish both Greta and Noah the very best of luck in their in their startups. That's uh, words to live by. Thank you so much, Sandy. Kenya, what is your final thought? Yeah, so I'll just say one of the things I love about this show is that people come here to learn, right? They come here to learn, they come here to laugh and to be entertained. And I love when we have such creative people that come on here and contribute their experience and their expertise. So Sandy, I just want to thank you for returning back. You always have great things to contribute to the show and, and to the platform. So we always appreciate your insight. And I just, you know, want to applaud, you know, Haim for what you're doing with these, you know, awesome students and how you're really helping them develop that entrepreneurial mindset. Obviously, we see the fruit of your program here today. We heard wonderful uh, presentations from both Noah and both Greta. So I wish you both all the best with your businesses. And I thank you for just coming on to Passage to Profit and helping us learn a little bit more today. So thank you. Absolutely wonderful. So uh, that's about it for us. Uh, stay tuned for next week's episode of Passage to Profit. And thank you for listening. Keep those cards and letters coming in. Uh, but before we go, I'd like to shout out uh, a special thanks to our producer, Noah Fleischman, our program coordinator, Alicia Morrissey, our ec video editor, Chatterboss, and the whole iHeart team. You're listening to Passage to Profit on iHeart Radio. WOR 710, the voice of New York.